What is up guys? Welcome back. Today I've got a very special video for you guys. It's something that I've been wanting to do in the Supra ever since I got it and I feel like a lot of people want to do it as well. They just don't know how or they're afraid of the amount of work that it takes. So today I'll be showing you how to swap a six-speed manual transmission inside your automatic Toyota Supra. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, so before we get started on the car, I just want to go through every part that you'll need to get the swap done. From left to right, we have a drive shaft, so you need one that matches your new transmission. In my case, the new transmission is a V160 out of a Toyota Supra, so it's the OEM transmission for this car, but it's really hard to get. It's very rare, in good condition, and it's really, really expensive as well. Um, if you're going to do something on a budget, I recommend going with either the T56 Magnum from Granas or a CD009 from Nissan, which uh, you can get kits for to adapt on the 2JZ. So yeah, plenty of options there. I just wanted to go with the OEM transmission since this will be a street car and uh, it has to pass street regulations. In Switzerland, they're really strict. So the more OEM parts I have, the better. Now, moving on to this, those are the pedals. I got the brake and the clutch. The brake you need because it's a different size. Uh, the pad is smaller to allow the clutch to fit on there. So you have to replace that. Then I've got some transmission mount in case your transmission did not come with it. This is a crucial part. This is the transmission tunnel. You will have to cut your car and uh, weld this one up. So just a heads up, it isn't just a bolt-in type situation. There is some welding, cutting, grinding, painting required. So just keep that in mind. Now on the right side, all of these are the shifter linkages and the boots and everything. So this will go on the end of the transmission over there. Moving on, we have a Tilton hydraulic release bearing. That thing goes really well with the twin disc Tilton clutch. Uh, so that should be plenty streetable and should hold enough power. I also got the ARP uh, flywheel studs, which are reinforced to go with it. And in the back here, we have all of the clutch uh, master cylinder kit. So I've got a clutch line and the actual master itself right there. This is a three fourth uh, bore. So it's a little bit bigger, should be better with the bigger clutch uh, compared to OEM. And it's also a little bit more compact. And Granas also makes uh, these adapter plates, which lets you bolt any type of uh, standard master cylinder to your Toyota Supra uh, firewall. So that's great. Good to have. Can't wait to put that in. And on the right, finally, we have the center control piece for the manual uh, shifter. So that's the one piece that's really required on the interior. But I also got the uh, whole center console piece here with the armrest and everything because mine is broken. So that's optional, that's required. Now regarding the drive shaft, it is in two pieces. So you have the rear section here and the front over there and each corresponds to whatever it's connected to. So the rear section corresponds to the differential and the front corresponds to the gearbox. So you need to make sure to get the correct length for whatever you're using. I'm using the big Supra differential, the 220 millimeter. So I already had this rear section, the correct length. Now my front does not correspond or did not correspond to the V160 gearbox. That's why, as you can see here, I got it extended by 43 millimeters. That's the approximate difference between this transmission and uh, the other one over there. So that's something you'll have to do, or you can just swap out this front section for the V160, but they're really hard to find. Um, I didn't find any in time, so that was my only option. Now, there's always the option to go with a single piece drive shaft, but um, that's also a couple of weeks wait, so I did not want to do that. And it would be a lot more expensive as well. So whatever you do, make sure to get the correct length for the specific option that you're going with. Last but not least, once everything is back together, you'll need some proper fluid to make it run smoothly and safely. So this is what I chose. I have some Toyota Red coolant, some 10W40 engine oil. This is the new replacement for the V160 transmission. Back in the days, Toyota made a dedicated oil just for the V160 transmission. It's been really hard to get and it's discontinued now. So this is the OEM replacement for it. It's just as good uh, and it's a lot cheaper. So I went with this. Now, this is some power steering fluid. I have some rear differential oil as well, but it's over there. Uh, some brake fluid as well. And this is just lubricant for myself. All right, so now that everything is ready to go, let's start with step one, which is removing the transmission tunnel and uh, replacing it with the new piece that we have for the manual transmission. Thank you. 
All right, so quick update of the interior. As you can see, the metal section is all gone and I have full access to the metal, uh, but I'm not sure how far forward I need to go and if I need to remove the dash. So what I wanna do now is uh, leave it like this, get under the car and figure out exactly where the spot welds are so I can know um, how far I need to make room. Now looking at it from underneath, uh, we can see the big hole where the shifter usually goes and then there's these two for the handbrake and that bracket right there can be removed pretty much right away. So I need to find the spot welds and drill it out. Now once that's done, I think there is a seam that goes around uh, this part right there. You can barely see it. So that's what I'm going to try and clean up and see if I can find the spot welds underneath and uh, drill them out. Obviously the best case scenario would be if I can drop the entire piece and replace it with this thing. Um, I don't know if that's possible or if it's even built the same way, but um, yeah, I guess we'll find out. And that's what I'm gonna try and do. All right, now that's looking a lot better. As you can see, the bracket is pretty much free. It's only attached to that piece that I'm trying to remove. So that's not a big deal. Now, I was able to go all the way around the seam and um, expose all of the spot welds, so there is a bunch there all around the panel. Now, I wanna be really careful of how I drill my spot welds because on some places I wanna go through, like uh, on the side here, and on some places I don't like those right there because the dashboard gets in the way and I cannot weld this from the top, so I'm going to have to do it from the bottom. So check this out, I've got all of my spot welds drilled. I went through on all of those and I didn't go through on these three. Um, otherwise the bracket is still on there. And now if I just pull on this, you can see how easily it comes off. Uh, there's probably a little bit of a cutting to do here, but it's pretty much undone. I finally got it out and here you can see the difference between the automatic trans tunnel and the manual trans tunnel. Uh, they're really similar except for the height. So this one is much taller uh, compared to that one. You can see there, this ends up being at the same height as this, but here you can see a big step, which is not there. So yeah, a lot taller, bigger opening there. But otherwise the general size of those two pieces is exactly the same. So this should be as simple as just swapping the two. Uh, there shouldn't be any other modification needed. So I'm just going to clean the car up and uh, then test fit it on there. And if it's good, just go ahead and weld it. All right, so I just got done with the welds. As you can see there, they came out pretty well. Uh, they're decent and fairly clean, so I'm happy about that. And they're plenty strong. I'll show you the underside real quick and then we'll attack the paint. And there is the underside. So you can see the spot welds every few centimeters. And I did some stitch welding up here since I didn't have holes to actually uh, do spot welds. I did the same thing on this side since uh, there was no bracket on this side, so I didn't have holes. But on this side, I had the holes so you can see the spot welds again. Now the next step will be painting this so it doesn't rust. I'll do it in three stages. First stage is 2K primer, then uh, some undercoating, and then 2K paint on top. I don't really wanna go into the details of painting in this video, so I'm just gonna leave it at that and you'll see me paint in the next clips. Let's do it. The primer has dried, I've done three full coats and uh, now I'm just gonna sand it lightly and apply some seam sealer along the edge there to seal everything shut and uh, I'll do the same on the inside as well.
one eternity later. All right, so I'm finally done with the whole trans tunnel install. It was really tedious, but uh, I think I did a pretty good job. So let me show you what it looks like right now. The paint just finished drying uh, last night, so now it's ready to go. As you can see, it's uh, all covered and should be well protected against rust. So let me show you the inside real quick as well, and then we'll keep going with the gearbox. And there's the inside all protected as well. I didn't use any undercoating as uh, it's probably not necessary in here, but there's still primer and paint on there, so it should be also well protected. And now let's go back to the gearbox. Now in the back of the engine, I've already removed the automatic transmission. It's over there. Uh, by the way, that was a huge pain. You need to undo the torque converter through here before uh, pulling the transmission out. And I didn't have access because obviously the engine is sitting on the pallets. So we had to lift the engine up and get access under there, but it's done. And I've gone ahead and replaced my rear main seal already, just in case. So now it should be ready for the installation of the clutch. Speaking of which, this is the new clutch. It is a Tilton twin disc uh, sprung clutch and it's got the flywheel as well and ARP flywheel bolts. Uh, so it's the full package and it is absolutely beautiful and super heavy as well. So here you can barely see both discs. So one here, one down there and the pressure plate on top and this sandwich plate in the middle. Now I'm going to unpack it, show it in more details and Install it, obviously. All right, I finally got the clutch installed. It was a pain to align. I actually used the gearbox uh, to get the shaft in there and align the second disc. So it's a pain without the tool, but it's doable. But let me just say, wow, this clutch is beautiful. It's such a great piece of engineering. Happy to have it in the car, and I hope it performs as well as it looks. So the next step is to sort out the release bearing. There's actually a couple of options. You can use the OEM system with a pull type bearing and a fork and everything, or you can use a hydraulic bearing like this one. This is from Tilton and it fits right onto the gearbox or the shaft of the gearbox right there. And the big advantage is that it's self adjusting because it's hydraulic. So you can get a consistent pedal feel all throughout the life of the clutch. But the downside is you need to adjust it very specifically to your clutch and to your engine. So this thing needs to be set up with a certain tolerance because as the clutch wears, it's going to get closer to the gearbox and you don't want this interfering into the gearbox. It could cause some damage. So you need to make sure there's plenty of space, even though it's self-adjusting, you need to make sure that when it does adjust, it doesn't interfere with the gearbox housing. Basically what I'm trying to do now is to set the clearance between my bearing and the pressure plate. So this sits in here somewhat like this and I need to make sure that this is at the proper height. So there is thread on this piece right there. So I can, uh, I can basically adjust the depth at which this sits and I need to adjust it exactly to where the difference between or the distance between this face is exactly one eighth of an inch off of this face. That allows for enough clearance in case the discs wear inside the clutch and this plate comes up. So one eighth of an inch is what they recommend. And there it is. My final measurement from the face of the bearing to the bell housing was 7.72 centimeters, whatever that means. In case you're doing the same thing, you might want to check if you get similar measurements. But basically now I have two lines coming off. Those are, uh, it doesn't matter which one's what, as long as your top one is the bleed uh, and the other one is the feed. So I just need to be careful with that. And on the clutch side, everything should be ready to go. So let's try and mate those up and uh, see if we get a manual transmission.
And just like that, we officially have a manual transmission onto this engine. I am super stoked. That was probably the easiest install I've ever done. The gearbox went right in, everything was lined up. Overall, just perfect so far. The next step involves fiddling with wires. So if you thought that was gonna be a simple Michael Bolton, well, you couldn't be more wrong. But don't worry, I got you. I'm gonna show you exactly what to do with those wires. There are a couple of options though, so don't just blindly do whatever I do. Make sure it's the right thing for you, your setup, and whatever you wanna use the car for. So without further ado, let's get to wiring. Let's start with the easiest and ramp it up. So this is my automatic wiring loom. It's got a bunch of plugs and connectors on it. Uh, but the one you want first is going to be that longest one, that black one. And it's really complicated. It plugs right into the speed sensor, hopefully. Yeah, there it is. Done. That's the first plug done. Now, on this Getrack V160 transmission, there are only two plugs. So there is this one for the RPM and there is that one for the reverse light switch. Now, mine is damaged here, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit of soldering and uh, shrink tubing to get this working properly. But basically, yours will be something like this with the connector down here. So what you want to do is connect these two wires to the corresponding two wires inside of, where is it, this connector here. Now which wire it is exactly, I'm going to tell you right now. It should be that yellow wire on the top right, right there, and the black and red wire in the back here. I'm not sure exactly what pin those are, but uh, it's easy to recognize with the colors. So you want to cut these two wires off and uh, make a new connector to connect to these two wires right here. Again, there are a million ways to connect two wires together, so do whatever you feel most comfortable with. In my case, I'm going to chop this one off and replace it with another uh, standard connector, which I'm either going to use this brand new one or use a salvaged one from another car. Uh, not sure yet. I'll do whatever feels the easiest. So once you've connected these two sensors, there's actually just one more thing to do. And no, I'm not kidding. It is actually this simple. You will need to take care of the reverse lockout. So as you know, on automatic transmissions, you cannot start the car unless you're in neutral or in park. So that's exactly the switch you want to bypass in a sense. And uh, the way to do that is actually uh, to connect the two wires of that switch together. And that will tell the system that uh, you're in neutral. So it will let you start the car and drive. Now, there is a couple of ways to do this. The easiest one is to grab the two wires on this plug, the two bigger ones right there. I think it's pin five and six um, officially. But basically, it's that black one and black and white one. Uh, the two big ones, you want to cut them off and solder them together. That's the first way to do it. But the problem with that is that they'll be constantly connected and uh, you may not want that. So if your car has a cruise control, just like mine, that will cause some trouble because the car will think that you're in neutral all the time. So you won't be able to activate the cruise control. So you probably don't want to do that on a car that has cruise control. In case yours don't have cruise control, you can go ahead and do that. No problem. It's always going to work and that's perfect. Since mine has cruise control, I'm going to be putting a switch on the clutch pedal, which connects to those two wires and it will let me conveniently trick the system into believing that I'm in neutral whenever I press the clutch. So that means I have to press the clutch to start the car, but it also means that whenever I press the clutch, it will disengage cruise control, which is exactly what I want. So guys, that's why I'm saying do your research, figure out what's best for your application. This, in my opinion, is the best I can do with the cruise control. So that's what I'm going for. Now let's get to wiring and I'll show you guys the result once done. All right, so the wiring is almost done. I fixed my sensor up. I ended up using the old connector because it had a nice stud to go inside the bracket. I've added this bracket and that bracket, and then I capped everything off uh, with tape so it looks nice and it doesn't get flooded with water. Now, again, I just plugged this one in, no modification needed. And as far as that big connector with the two black wires goes, 
I guess I forgot to mention that you can splice them anywhere in the loom so you don't have to do it at the connector itself. A lot of people like to do it there because it's easy. You can just cut them, solder them together. But since I'll be using this sensor on the clutch pedal, I might as well just take it straight from the ECU. So on that plug that goes to the ECU, there should be pin 77 and 76. So essentially this is where the two wires end up. So what I'm gonna do is put a connector straight into here and then run my wires from the connector to the clutch pedal and to, the, to that sensor. But for that, I'm actually gonna need a second two pin connector and I need to wait until everything is back in the car so I can actually measure the correct length between the ECU and my clutch pedal. So for now, I guess that's it for the gearbox and let's move on to the pedals. Back inside the car, you wanna check the pedals. There should be all the way down there, this little opening. This is basically where the clutch master cylinder should sit and it's already pre-cut so I can go ahead and take it off. And now you can see where you need to drill for the master cylinder. There are the two holes on the side for the bolts and the big one in the middle for the push rod. Also under here, we should be able to access the brake attachment points. Uh, so there should be a pivot up there and the push rod. That should be easy enough. I'm gonna get that out first so I can get more room to actually drill the clutch master cylinder holes. All right, so I just got the big hole done. As you can see there, that's how much I took out. And we've got a nice and clean hole right there. Now I'm gonna clean it up a little bit more and uh, make sure it's protected against rust. But once that's done, we should be pretty much good to go to bolt everything on and be done with the pedals. I'm finally done installing the pedals. There's just a couple more things to do, so I'm gonna try and show it as best I can. If you can see the clutch pedal right there, you'll notice I haven't actually connected the master cylinder. I need to adjust the stop, which uh, you can see right there, I added the screw. So there is a safe stop to make sure the, the bearing doesn't go too far. So that's something I need to adjust, and also I'm gonna wire the neutral switch uh, in here. Now the brake pedal is nothing too complicated. It's a direct swap, so it's just like before. Just has a little bit of a different shape. And that's it for the pedals. And on the other side of the wall, we have obviously the Willwood Master Cylinder all installed and ready to go. Now let's finish the wiring. I've just made this little loom that goes from the clutch sensor to the ECU with a plug so I can disconnect everything if I need to remove the engine. And uh, all I need to do is wire it directly to the plug to the ECU. And as I've said before, it should be pins number 77 and 76. Those are right down here. The two black wires at the end there, those are the two that I need to cut in order to solder in here. So let's do it real quick. And there's the final result with my quick disconnect right there. Now I'm going to install this in the car real quick, but that pretty much concludes all of the custom work that needs to be done in order for the transmission to work. So at this point, all that's left is setting up the clutch pedal with the correct travel so it doesn't blow out the hydraulic release bearing. But otherwise, all it needs is some fluid, which I'm going to refill now before I put everything back in the car. And then just installing everything back as it should be on a six-speed Supra. It's the moment of truth. My shifter works perfectly, even the reverse goes in. So that's all ready to go. Now let's put the engine back in the car. All right, all right, the engine is finally done. Uh, it's not completely done, but it's far enough to where I can actually start it. I haven't finished with the transmission. The interior isn't done as well. 
but uh, we should be able to start the car. So I want to get it started, see if everything works, because remember, we just did an engine rebuild. I don't know how well that worked yet. So I just want to get the engine started to check that everything's okay. And then we can button up the rest, do the interior and actually drive this thing. Hell yeah, the engine sounds really good. Um, it started right away as you saw, so I think we did a really good job on the rebuild. Now, there's still a couple of things to button up. As you saw, it's missing the radiator, uh, the pulley in the front, and a couple of other things. So let's get it done real quick so we can finally go for a test drive in this manual transmission Supra. If it's really awesome and I have time, I might make a video review of the V160. So if that's something you wanna see, comment down below, let me know. And for the final touch, boom. So that's it guys, the car is finally 100% back together. As you can see, the engine bay looks just like before. You can't even see the massive cylinder in the back there. And the interior, they changed quite a lot. So here you go. You can see the new shifter and uh, actually the gauges I haven't switched yet, but you can put the manual transmission gauges in there or you can get custom ones, which uh, I've ordered. So that'll be the next thing. Other than that, it's pretty much the same just with the manual shifter, which looks so much better in my opinion. That big automatic uh, shifter does not look good. And I'm glad we got it out of there. Now, the thing that everybody's probably waiting for is a test drive. Unfortunately, the car isn't registered yet, so I cannot go for a test drive, but I can start it up and show you guys what it looks like. So foot on the clutch. There we go. Neutral. Um, not sure where their lights are. There we go. Okay. So the best I can do is pretty much just shift through all the gears and uh, that's it. So let's go ahead. First gear. Oh, you can see the traction control going off there because uh, the rear wheels are spinning, but the front aren't. So let me deactivate it. There we go. Now it's off. Even says it right there. So yeah, let's drive it a little bit. Second gear. Everything seems fine. Third gear. Fourth gear. Fifth. And sixth. Now, if you can hear some sounds coming from the gearbox, it's not the gearbox itself. It's just because there is no load on it. So it kind of goes back and forth and wiggles. So that's normal. But uh, yeah, it seems to work perfectly. Now we can try reverse as well. Just pull it, go to the right. There we go. Now we're in reverse. Back to neutral. And that's it. All right, so that's it. We've officially transformed the Supra into a six-speed manual. So I'm really stoked about that. And I hope that you enjoyed the process and enjoyed seeing this. It's a little bit different than my usual content, but um, I think it's the same idea. And most of all, I hope that this video was helpful to you if you're trying to do the same thing or if you're just browsing for information. 
Looking at different options in terms of transmission, you don't have to go with a V160. It's the same process for any other transmission like the CD009, which is a really good transmission. You can also go with the Gran S uh, T56 Magnum, which is an amazing transmission. They've had great results and I would have gone with it if I didn't find this V160 at a decent price. Now, if this ever blows, I will definitely go with the P56. I'm really curious about it and they can hold up to north of 1000 horsepower. So definitely a really good choice there. Uh, it's a little bit pricier than say this CD009, but it's brand new and you have all the support behind it from Granus, so you can get it rebuilt anytime. There are plenty of parts available. You can even choose what gear set you want to run and what rear end you want. So full customization there and it's a full kit. So you get everything that you need for installation and for it to work properly. So I definitely recommend that. And either way, be it V160, T56, or CD009, you can't go wrong with any of them, and there's plenty of support for all of them. So all I'm saying is that if you want a manual transmission, it's definitely possible, even on a budget. So go ahead and do it. I recommend it. And if you need any support, I'm there. Ask me any questions. This video should already answer pretty much all of the questions you may have. So there you go, it's all there. Now go ahead and get your car to the next level. Thanks a lot for watching. Subscribe to see more. Like, share, subscribe, do all the good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.